Uh, and with us, we have today one of the big metal legends, uh, Logan Nader, who has had a fantastic career um, playing for different groups, different bands, doing a lot of productions besides just being an, just being an artist and, and guitarist. He's also a master of production. Um, so we will get into all that. What we'll do is have a good a talk about his, his catalog, his career in general, and then the partnership of Aino Music. And we'll close this session off with a, a little round of Q&A. We already received quite some questions from fans over chat and on our email. So we have plenty of things to dig into. So with that said, um, let's start with the first questions uh, for Logan. So um, maybe the easiest thing to start off with, Logan, can you give us a small introduction of who you are and why we should know Logan Mader as an artist? Uh, well, I've been doing, mu been doing music for about 28 years now, starting with Machine Head. First record came out in 1994. Uh, long story short, I've done about a thousand shows in 33 countries and collected five gold records as an artist and a producer. Um, and as a producer and or engineer, mixer or composer, I have 87, I counted the other day on allmusic.com, 87 uh, albums released internationally on record labels as my credits go. So I, uh, I dabble in the music thing <laughs> that, a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'm still doing music today. I, I played in Machine Head for many years and I played in Soulfly on the first album cycle. I did a short thing with a band called Medication that was fun. And then I started producing in two, around 2000, 1999. And I have done, obviously, well, I've done 87 records since then um, as a producer and mixer and whatever, engineer, composer. Um, so, and I've gotten into a little bit of visual media stuff, uh, you know, some film placements here and there. So movie trailers, movie trailers don't pay like, royalties but they pay like a one-off fee and so i've done a lot of movie trailers music and um and that's, yeah that's a pretty uh, impressive track list to well to start with uh, a lot of things to do uh, 78 albums quite quite a bit 87 no. <laughs> 87 yeah. sorry sorry <laughs> no, I'm, dys good. I'm dyslexic so that we can't yeah. take the mathematics <laughs> i translated it perfectly <laughs> Oh. Um, yeah, I'm also working in the cannabis industry. I've started working for uh, 22 Red. This side note, you know, for uh, 22 Red is a cannabis, cannabis brand founded by Shabo from the band System of a Down. It's a really cool brand. It's music and cannabis really overlaps. And a lot of my cannabis relationships have come from music and vice versa. So it's a, it's a nice culture here in America that we have legalized cannabis as a, as a nice business. So and it, it interacts with music in a lot of ways. Yeah. So uh, just just for the people listening, you are based in uh, Los Angeles. No, in Las Vegas right now. Yeah. And that's where. Las, yeah, Las Vegas. I have a house. I, my you know, but I spend a lot of time in LA, and I work in LA. I work in three in, in Nevada, LA, and Arizona. So, but I mainly live in in uh, where am I? Vegas. Vegas, Vegas, baby. Yeah. Nice. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you. Did you know early on that you wanted to become an artist or did you always have that feeling for music? And what, what is it that made you pick up the guitar and become a guitar player or guitarist? Yeah, well, I come from a musical family. So my, was, my household was very musical. My father's a blues guitar player. He was playing with John Lee Hooker back in the seventies. So for a white guy to be good enough to play lead guitar for John Lee Hooker is, uh, is he must be pretty good. So I know he's good, you know, I mean, he's a great player. Um, so that's sort of in my DNA, that, that blues guitar player musical vibe. My mother's an opera singer. I started taking piano lessons when I was nine years old and I was killing it, but it stopped quickly because I wasn't reading. I didn't like reading the music and the teacher caught me. I was memorizing this Chopin, Bach, Vivaldi, and I'm killing it. Little kid crushing it with perfect timing and feel, but I would memorize it. I didn't like, I would read it once and then memorize it. And then she caught me like not turning the page. And she's like, what do you? how are you not turning the page sorry i was like i i don't need to i don't need to read the music i memorize it i feel it i'm this little kid telling her that and she's like no you have to read it and turn the page every time and i was like that's not fun 
that's like school. I want to play. So I quit that. And I still played a little bit, but then I lost interest until I was 15 and my mom got me a guitar. And by this point, I had discovered the Bay Area thrash metal scene, like Metallica, beginning of Metallica, Exodus, uh, Testament from LA that was Slayer. And this music uh, resonated with me because it was dangerous and I loved it. It got my, my heartbeat going. It was something cool about it. It scared my mom. It even scared me a little bit and I liked it. It was dangerous. And we had a whole scene of concerts happening all the time in San Francisco and in Oakland. It was a great time to be a kid. Um, all ages concerts to go there and get in a mosh pit and let your aggressions out and in a safe place where it's almost like really therapeutic to go there and come out having let off steam, like, like, like letting off a bunch of little earthquakes instead of that big one, you know? So yeah, that was a cool I, part of my, you know, that was my inspiration. That's what I, that's what made me want to play guitar is that those Bay area thrash metal bands where I grew up in the Bay area, Oakland, California. That, that makes that makes a lot makes a lot of sense because it resonates also to me what you're just saying like you you go to those metal concerts i remember when i was 14 15 going to like the small you know youth clubs in in your city mm -hmm. where the, they were play, the metal bands were playing and you started seeing the mosh pits you, you automatically kind of um, moved moved into it um oh i just muted sorry um, so you kind of move, uh, Logan, I just muted you, you, you'll have to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, you move into it, you get pushed in those mosh pits, you see it as something super aggressive, but actually metal concerts are usually the most disciplined kind of concerts where everybody respects and helps each other. You get pushed down, everybody push, brings you up, like there's no need to wow. explain it. So that, that's what made you become... Uh, in the end, a, a guitar player, right? Yeah, that whole that culture and that energy, the danger, and the music itself. Putting, I you know, I buy those records on vinyl. I had them like vinyl records. Ride the lightning, kill them all. Uh, you know, the first two Slayer records, first Exodus, Bonded by Blood, and then you know, I would just sit in my room and listen to that, like listen to a whole record. You know, back when <laughs> people listened to uh, records. <laughs> Um, the way we consume music, obviously, is so much different today, more fast paced and more overloaded. But yeah, it was a it was a cool time for me to uh, discover music and to have it have it really ignite my creative spirit. Yeah, definitely. But also, you just mentioned the rise of, of Metallica, the, the rise of Metallica coming. Uh, uh, George, can you please keep yourself muted, please? Otherwise, I'll yep. Yeah, my bad. It will be in the afterwards for questions. Come on, George. <laughs> Pull it together. <laughs> so um, you, you started your career, I mean, also with Machine Head when they were starting. It was just still the early days of metal. You had the big bands of Metallica, Iron Maiden. They already had a good run. But you are just in the middle between that heavy metal scene of the old school, let's call them, and then the new metal scene, like mm -hmm. Machine Head really came in, in that right moment. Yeah, it was a, re a really cool moment. It was actually, so I was a co-founding member of Machine Head, the, you know, the beginning, very beginning of Machine Head, Rob uh, enlisted Adam Deuce and Adam brought me in. Rob didn't want me to join the band at the first. We were friends from around the scene. He was in the band Violence, which is a popular band in the Bay Area thrash scene. And they had done a few records and Rob was ready to move on from Violence and start his new band Machine Head with my good friend, Adam Deuce, who I grew up with. And Rob was like, nah, I don't want Logan in the band for whatever reason, we don't want to talk about that. But so Adam comes and we live together and I was writing a lot of guitar riffs. And so Adam took those guitar riffs, he knew them because he played them with me and he's playing them in front of Rob without me there and rob's like what's that well it's like a logan wrote this he's like huh oh, hmm and he's like he also wrote this and this and this and this and this and this and he's like huh okay well maybe i'll reconsider it so then i got in the band so that's how adam really got me into machine head by way of riffs that i had created um in my nice. bedroom so you, yeah you basically so, give but, your, your business card just by good riffs on guitar exactly <clears throat> So 
but yeah, so that was 1992 when the band formed in the middle of 92. Now this is this is sort of the tail end. This is when thrash metal started to take it a little bit of a dip, except for bands like Metallica and Slayer, you know, and Exodus Testament. They struggled a bit through that, but now they're still like surviving very well and thriving. But Pantera came up, came on the scene, and then the, the introduction of groove metal. It wasn't thrash, it wasn't speed metal, it was like groove metal, but it was heavy, aggressive, dangerous. We loved it. And then bands like Biohazard, that was a little more hardcore, a little more hip hop coming in. So that was starting to bubble up around the time Machine Head came out and we fit into this, you know, we didn't associate with thr the thrash metal very much. It's more so like this new groove metal sound from Oakland, California, which ended up transitioning through to new metal. And then grunge came in and killed like all that other metal. But new metal took off and went like, you know, very commercial with bands like Linkin Park and of course, amazing bands like Korn and System of a Down come out of all that and but anyway those 90s those that period in the late 90s was it belonged to Machine Head and that was a golden a golden age of music for a lot of reasons and I'm super fortunate I got to be a part of it and the band blew up and all of a sudden I'm just like touring all over the world living the dream um and it was a different time there was you know a lot less competition in the industry and there was, you know, no internet. So people had to buy music if they wanted to listen to it. So there was more money for bands to go on tour and, and, and sustain their, their careers and experience that even still a little bit of that whole rock star decadence, fun, crazy madness that you might imagine from, you know, being on tour with Pantera, for example, <laughs> crazy fun times, priceless memories. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Bye. If I look at back at documentaries, because unfortunately i was too young to to leave that area i mean i lived that but at my three-year-old nobody would have let me go out uh so i mean looking at that it's really a big change from from the scene now right yeah it's a much different place and the way people uh, based on the way people consume music and how much of it is out there and how short the attention spans are and how you have to grab people in a different way but still live music live performance is in my opinion still the best way to connect with your fans and to solidify um, uh, maintaining relationships with your fans and having them stay with you and grow with you and that's something about heavy metal that's very unique to metal even though it's the smallest genre of music across the board for the most part and doesn't make as much money as like rap and pop and country and all this you know mainstream rock but metal fans once they love you they're going to love you forever you know, they, they don't forget about you. If you, as long as you keep making good music and you keep coming to play for them, they're going to love you forever. Machine has a good example. 30 years later, they're crushing it in arenas right now. And, uh, and I, I got to go back to Machine Head, obviously, like for the 25th anniversary of Burn My Eyes, the first album I did in 2019 and 2020 for a beautiful world tour that was amazing. I got to go back to relive that whole thing. And it was even bigger than, than it was before. And it was really, really amazing. And then we were supposed to go back to Europe, back to Russia, and then Australia and, and Japan, but the pandemic hit, so that was, got cut short. And now Machine Head's like restructured and they're doing this new thing with this new record. I have one, a one I think I, yeah, I did one song on the new record and <clears throat> um, that, uh, I will go part-time with them. Like I may go back in 2024, who knows? I, the, the the door is open to to work with them again you know so as a collaborator and as a, as a touring guitar player so it's pretty cool to know that's that, that's definitely that, cool to know for yeah. for the people here and the people that are willing to invest in your catalog because that might be a good indicator going forward i mean who knows uh <laughs> but it, the, sh the old, that old shit's still relevant is what it says to me you know so yeah. something, yeah, something's yeah. cool about that yeah um, in, in our chats, uh, before we, we got a very interesting question about your catalog from David Elson, who, who was like, which song or album best describes the Logan Mager sound and how often do you, oh yeah. And then he had a fun question asking about your dreadlocks, actually, if, when you play, if you can do the percussion with them on, on, on your guitar. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> First part. I think the opening riff of the album, Burn My Eyes, which is the song Davidian, I wrote that riff. Um, it's pretty iconic and very recognizable and it uses the natural harmonics like for the first time, that was like a cool thing Machine Head did that no other bands were doing that, you know, kind of that cool niche signature thing. I would say that's probably the most 
notable and and defining riff of of moment of my guitar playing you know that that matters and it's still to this day you know so um that and the dreadlocks <laughs> they when i'm headbanging and stuff they actually get in the way sometimes and hit the strings and so I, when they start hitting the strings i cut them they get too long and then i can control it and <laughs> but uh yeah not intentionally uh picking my guitar strings with my dreads no <laughs> would, would have been possible <laughs> um no, but that's that's cool and and definitely i mean the dividian song and the intro on its own is is very iconic it's something you you easily recognize as especially if you like metal you will mm -hmm. easily go there um but the entire album was quite groundbreaking i mean i think you were one of the first metal albums to hit the top charts um in in that period uh definitely for the label that you were on it was the top selling uh um album that came out um, until slipknot came around but um, yeah yeah it was the best-selling debut in the history of roadrunner up until slipknot came out of course so yeah um yeah it's <clears throat> one of those records man it's it's that first record you have your whole life to write it you know yeah i, I mean and... I, I see nick uh one of our, our colleagues not nodding here he's also an artist in the hip-hop and, and tech house scene so oh, he's he totally feels you uh, from his reaction that yeah 100 <laughs> percent yeah so there's that about it and it was just the magic in the air you know we would we were getting we were in a room together writing it organically just jamming and not like well like the way, the way i write today is a lot different with we have technology we write and record our ideas and then share them or sit in a room and the writing process is more like in the studio these days but that was in a room you know sweaty ass ghetto ass warehouse in east oakland california it was like drug addicts and criminals and just dirty ass shit and just a vibe and we went in there and just uh, <laughs> it was it was fun you know so if you, you you have to compare between writing a song or creating a song back in the day and doing it now like you say we have all this technology but is there one or the two that you first of all you prefer and secondly that you see that the progress in creating the song is faster <clears throat> well i'm i'm way more efficient now as a writer partly in use of technology and my studio and not sitting in a room with guys say hey play this riff learn this riff you know kind of thing um there's definitely something to be said for that but actually that i'll, I'll take it to an example i was just in salt lake city too for the last few days doing a writing session with seven cooks in the kitchen, literally like four rappers and singers, another producer besides myself, who, who was also a rapper and a musician and another guitar player beside myself, all writing. And we came out with seven songs in two days and they're freaking smashers. And the harmonious energy and the lack of ego and the, the amount of productivity that came out of that room with seven creators in a room blew my mind. And it made me so happy and made me, feel the inspiration that I haven't felt since burn my eyes. So it's a oh. different type, but it's like, it's like that. And it's a new project that I'm doing right now. And there's actually one lottery ticket in my catalog from this new project. It's a brand new thing. We're writing new stuff now, but one song has been released already and it's in my catalog. It's called raised by wolves. It, it's in there. It hasn't really monetized yet, but the artist is John Widowmaker and this thing is going to blow up. So when the artist John Widowmaker blows up, all the songs will move with it. So. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, they, they, Keep an eye on that one. Keep an eye on that one. Yeah. They, they, what, what you say is very true. I mean, just to give the, the most popular comparison that we can give right now is, is probably Billie Irish, right? She produced a lot of music in her room. Then suddenly she became popular and songs that she created four or five years ago just blew up massively. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, being an early bird on good songs can be very yeah. efficient for your your portfolio <laughs> and your yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and, and so my next question would have been like, okay, we have a playlist with all your tracks uh, in your catalog. There's so many really big ones that I mean, good songs that are famous have millions of streams already. But what would you say is the hidden gem in that catalog? Like the, the song that isn't as popular as all the rest, but you, for you has a special meaning or yeah, or that you think that will blow up? 
Well, that one I just told you, Raised by Wolves, that would be the hidden gem right there. That's a diamond in the rough, for sure. There's a lot of action going on with that project right now. You're going to hear a lot about it really soon. It's like, I mean, we got picked up by management for management by Doug Goldstein, who managed Guns and Roses for 17 years. And he collaborates with Michael Olaga, who is one of the most prolific A&R guys in the history. He signed Metallica and Zombie and The Misfits and The Ramones and Tina Turner and Cyndi Lauper. So, <laughs> and yeah. he loves he's on board and this is a brand new baby band. And so it's got like this action going on. We've, it has many arms as well. We created a, a, a nonprofit 501c branded music festival called Pow Wow. It's, this stands for Prisoners of the War on Weed. And this is a, a nonprofit designed to raise funding to help people who have been incarcerated for nonviolent cannabis charges who are sitting in jail right now. And they shouldn't be, that's a mistake because we've reformed the laws in most of the states of our, of our country. But you, like this, you've got a guy driving on a Las Vegas strip in a Lamborghini in a $10 million house from selling weed. There's another guy just like him from a little few years earlier selling weed is doing 10 years in prison in you know, like with murderers and rapists and crazy people. And that's not right. And we're going to help these people and we're going to raise money to get them out because we can. We get the right lawyers, the right organizations, the right press. And we're going to do this and we're going to document the stories when we have success. We will we'll film it and share these stories that are going to be very emotional like a man getting out of prison in early five years and he gets to be reunited with his family we're going to capture that moment and share it. it's going to be really emotional and, and meaningful and like wow. to see his kids again and stuff so that's part of the john widowmaker arm and we will be debuting this festival we have our own stage at a huge huge music festival multimedia festival uh, that is nfl affiliated and is happening during the super bowl weekend a mile or two away from the Super Bowl. I'm expecting over 100,000 attendees. We have our own stage for powwow in this event. It has cannabis consumption approved. It has NFL alumni. It has VR, AR, like Wiz Khalifa's on it. Snoop is LOI'd. Uh, Mike Tyson will be there. A lot of podcasters, VR, AR. Food, booze, free weed, five stages of music. So, so in Arizona, Super Bowl weekend, that's happening. And that's all part of the John Widowmaker you know, entity. Nice. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wasn't aware about this project, first of all. So thanks for sharing. Great stuff. I mean, everybody knows where they need to go if they are in the US. Otherwise, get a flight, go to the Super Bowl weekend and just go to the concert. Uh, that's always good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. But, but again, another way that you can show what impact music can make on people, right? I mean, it's, it's not just this listening experience or the emotional experience. You as an artist have an influence and what you do with that influence and that power. Uh, I mean, that for me, this is a, a beautiful showing of the person you are also. Um, that's, what power, that's what power is all about. It's selfless servitude to other people and helping people who deserve it, you know, without expecting anything in return from it. I mean, yeah, it's, it's good for everybody, but, you know, the, the intentions are very pure and heartfelt and meaningful so my singer from john Widow, john widowmaker himself he's actually a survivor of the war on weed he did five years in federal prison in uh, convicted in oklahoma and a year after he was sentenced and it was a nonviolent cannabis crime and he didn't even have the cannabis he someone i don't know he, anyway he he did he was doing his sentence and oklahoma all of a sudden made cannabis is legal and it's the most lenient compliance of any state in America, it's the loosest. Like it's the most like free for all, free weed, it's all, anyone can have a license, all this stuff. And he's sitting in jail in Oklahoma for the same thing. And he didn't, he did his whole sentence. By the time he appealed it, it was already up. So he lived through this and it's, a, it's very close to his heart to help these other people to, who are in that situation to help them get out. Cause you know, yeah, it's a mistake in many cases and we're gonna help to fix that, so. Yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, all in support of, of, of musical projects that bring more than just the sound to, 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 to the world. So great job yeah. from my side. Respect for that. Thank um, you. Go, going back to you and your career, I mean, you've been around 25 years plus, I mean, nearly 30 years now, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, playing around, you've been connected with and playing for some of the biggest bands. Uh, I mean, you, you said we went on tour with Pantera, you worked with Soulfly, Gojira, King Alexandria, Fear Factory. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, but 
if you need to recall one highlight moment, what would that be for you? <clears throat> well, okay. The best show cane that I ever did. Now, show cane is like the feeling you get when you're on stage in front of people. It's a high. I call it show cane because it's a natural high. It's the best high. It's not cocaine. It's show cane. <laughs> so the best show cane that I ever did was Dynamo Open Air Festival 1995 in front of 130,000 motherfuckers that loved Machine Head, all of them. It was as far as I could see, it was people all there. And we were second from the headliner, um, big, you know, like it was the biggest show I ever did. And it really stands out to me as like that definitely big highlight of why I'd like to do what I do right there. That, that's why. Are they replays? On the live side. Are, it, I'm sorry, like on the on the performing side and the live music side of it, it's it's really all about that connection with people on the exchange of energy and that show came, like I said. But that's half of it. The other half is the creative part and being in the studio. And I love obviously I became a producer and I learned how to do all the engineering and everything because of my passion for that part of being an artist is the creative part making the records, writing the records, recording, mixing, all that. I love that part too. It's not, you don't get any showcane out of it, but you get that really good fulfilling feeling when you play something back that like feels so good. And it's when it's new and fresh and you're playing it for other people, industry people. And if they love it, then you love it more. And it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling. It's part of the fulfillment. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't, sadly, I don't make music, but I can feel that rewarding sound and, and I see Again, Nick laughing, who's, who's, who's really into creating music all day, every day. So, um, but during your career, at some point, you step away from the spotlight to really focus on producing. What was it that drove you to make those decisions? It was what I just said. It's like, I, I thought about what does it mean to me to be a, an artist, to be a musician in the music industry? And was, half of it is that show cane, the live performance is the gallivanting around the planet with, you know, a lot of freedom and beautiful like moments and, and travel. And then the other half is the creative part and that being in the studio. I remember the first time I went into a real studio that was in fantasy, fantasy records in Berkeley to do burn my eyes with Colin Richardson of Benny Wino. And I was just like, I am home. I love this place. What's that? What does that do? What's that thing? How'd you do that? And then I'm just like soaking up the game from the beginning. And I just had an instant, uh, I was drawn to it and I knew it. So after Soulfly, I found myself thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to go down this road, but it took me four years, three and a half years of grinding, learning, collecting gear, getting, doing every little demo that I could get my hands on, terrible bands, like not, no names mentioned, but like, you know, whatever I could get my hands on to do it. And that would, ha that's how I would gain experience. And that's how I would get better. And I would hone my crap. I would learn my gear. I would learn the, the, the DAWs and the whole thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a self for the most part, a self-taught thing, but it just required a lot of practice. Like anything else does is you put in the time, Put yourself in the proximity of others who are killing it in that and soak up the game and be around people that are doing it and you know just put yourself in there and go for it and so it took me about three and a half years before i got my first major label uh production credit yeah i mean it, it, it's an interesting story that one too the first one well uh, if, if you're willing to well, share I know full circle because I mentioned Colin Richardson. He produced the first Machine Head record and the second one. And he's an amazing producer, amazing mixer, amazing human being. So I fast forward to 2006, 2005. And I have a little studio in North Hollywood. I got my setup. Um, I think I had already, you know, I hadn't done, I hadn't done any really notable records at that point, but I was buzzing. People were coming to me and I was working and I was supporting myself from, from engineering, freelance producing and everything. So still being my own boss um and in the other studio the main studio of the facility where i had my little spot i had studio b studio a got booked and i see one day roy mayorga from at the time from soulfly he's from stone sour he's a drummer and ministry uh dino casares from fear factory dave mclean from machine head uh paul gray rest his soul from slipknot all show up in the studio a and i'm like what up guys and i knew them all from touring and stuff and i was in a band with roy and i was in a band with dave I'm like what are you guys doing here and you know told me we're doing this thing called roadrunner united it's the 25th anniversary of the record the roadrunner 
record label and there's four dudes that are like going to produce four songs each and they're picking from uh, roadrunner alumni from a list of qualified people my name was on the list but i wasn't picked <laughs> prior to that but i was there and i was like letting them blow hair if you guys run into any problems in the studio i know the room inside and out I'll get you running. I'll fix anything. I'm right next door. Let me know if you need any help. Sure enough, they're setting up drums. They're like, hey, this channel's down or this mic thing. Da, da, da. I went in there and I fixed it real quick. And then Dino's like, hey, Logan, you want to play a guitar track on this one song? And I said, hell yeah, I want to play a guitar track on that song. So he gave me the song. It's called The End. It was a single. It ended up being a single. He told me, do this clean guitar thing here like that. So I did the clean guitar thing here like that. And then I mixed the song because <laughs> it was already tracked. Everything was tracked on it. And he didn't know I was going to mix it. He didn't ask me to mix it. He didn't tell me not to, but I had the files. So I mixed it and mastered it and it sounded real good. And they were like, holy shit, what the hell? You did that? Wow. And they sent us a Monty Connor, the A&R guy, the, you know, Monty from Roadrunner, who legendary guy from Roadrunner now at Nuclear Blast. I mean, he signed Slipknot, Machine Head, Sepultura, Fair Factory, all these. Um, so they, they liked my mix, but Colin Richardson was already hired to mix all of Dino's four songs that he contributed to the album. <clears throat> And everyone liked my mix and they're like, well, let's still, we already have Colin on board to do it. We're going to have him mix it and then we'll pick. So Colin did his mix and everyone liked mine better. So they picked <laughs> mine over Colin Richardson. And I was like, damn, that's cool. Um, I mean, respect to Colin. Obviously he's an amazing mixer. I mean, he mixes amazing. But in that moment for that song, my mix had a better vibe for it and so they used mine and that was my first major label credit and from there everything monty started sending me tons of work he brought soulfly in we did one song cover marilyn manson cover next thing you know i'm producing cavalier conspiracy one cavalier conspiracy two and a soulfly record and in the cavalier conspiracy one i met joe from gojira who was bass player on that as a guest he he we vibed so i next thing i know i'm doing the way of all flesh for gojira and in that time then Five Finger Death Punch was a brand new band, and um, I got that record, and it just all snowballed out of that one Roadrunner United mix that I wasn't even supposed to do, but I did it. <laughs> in the start in the universal line, right? I mean, that's it has to do with putting yourself in proximity and being, you know, at least you can have a chance if you put yourself in the zone where you want to be around people who are doing the things that you want to do, even if you're not doing them yet. The first one of the first important things to do is to put yourself in the zone physically and, and emotionally and mentally. And so that I did that and it worked. Well, one of my next questions would have been like, do you have any advice for young artists that are listening or that want to start? I just think you gave a very important one. Hustle hard and put yourself in, in the right spots. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. Another thing that's really important, I think, for artists who are setting goals and working towards them is to set big ass goals way the top of the mountain but don't worry about that destination so much don't think about it think about today right now this moment and fall in love with the process and make sure you love what you do and if you enjoy it that's really important you're already winning and successful if you love what you do and you do what you love and and just don't think too much about how far away the top of the mountain is and how hard it is to get there and how long it's going to take. Just do whatever you can in that day and enjoy it. Before you know it, that top of the mountain will be like right here. It'll come to you and the things will start it'll magnet, magnetizing and turning on and it'll, it'll accelerate and you'll get there. Nice. But just be in love with the process. Yeah, I think that's very, I mean, I don't know, but... I think that's very important that you love what you're doing because that will automatically transmit and mm. in your sound and what you do, that's probably also why your mix was kick on there because you really wanted to do it. You did it out of passion and yeah, nice. Um, so you decided, well, what made you decide a little bit more about this partnership that we have ongoing right now? Uh, your catalog came online. Um, in six days, the entire auction sold out. Uh, people are now outbidding each other, trying to get those shares in. Um, how do you feel about that, that your catalog, so many years after you started your career, is still very popular and that fans and investors are now eager to get their hands on it? Well, it, it makes me feel very happy and grateful 
you know i didn't know it, how it was going to go and uh it's a, right now it's a good time for me to to do this i think it's uh it's quite helpful for me and my kids and uh it's uh it's a cool platform like i said before i think it's a really unique and a great way for fans to connect with the uh, with songwriters and vice versa and share on that journey of the lifelong journey of a song that they love it's you know like it's a it's forever yeah yeah and uh, so what what was it that made you decide that you wanted to leverage your back catalog and and share that portion of your success with the fans and, and with investors well it's this a mutual friend Bruno because I was offered because I was made aware of it I didn't know about it okay. and this guy out of nowhere who is a legit songwriter manager named Bruno and he's a really nice guy and he hit me up and I was like hmm that sounds interesting and you know I felt I felt comfortable I felt like I researched the platform it looks like people like it it's legit it's certainly not a scam or anything weird like that you know yeah that we we have a maybe in five years because i'm writing all the time maybe i'll do it again you know cool but i'm moving forward i'm always going to keep writing music you know so my new songs awesome yeah 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 no that's uh, uh that's that's very interesting and uh I'm, I'm happy to hear what you just said um we we got a question from uh mark cooper about uh, the partnership itself. And he, his question was, uh, if this partnership made you listen back to songs that maybe you have like forgotten or disappeared a little bit and you were like, oh yeah, I worked on that. That's in my catalog, right? Yeah, that is. That There was a couple. Yeah, it, <clears throat> it made me realize the Howard Jones trifecta that I had never thought about which is quite cool. Howard Jones from Kill Switch Engage, obviously, and Light the Torch. And then he, Light the Torch before them was called Devil You Know on their first record. And that was on Nuclear Blast. I produced that record and I did quite a bit of co-writing on that. And uh, so there's some of that in my catalog, some pieces of that. And then there was, then asking, I was working on the Asking Alexandria album from Death to Destiny. I did all the electronics and programming and keyboards on the whole record. And incidentally, they had asked, they wanted Howard Jones to do a guest vocal on one of the songs. And I was like, well, I'm working with him right now. Basically, he's in town. I can do that. I can track his vocals for you. And I ended up writing, writing it with him, his part. So I got that collaboration is in there as well. That song is called, I think, Until the End or The End. And it's on From Death to Destiny. Howard Jones featured on a, on a verse and a, a, or a chorus and a bridge. He's featured quite you know, prominently on the song. So that was the second Howard Jones collab that I did. And then random, I did as wrote a song with I uh, with John Moyer, the bass player from Disturbed, who is also a producer and a good songwriter and a good friend of mine. Um, we actually wrote the song, wrote some songs for Ivan Moody from Five Finger Death Punch because he claimed at the time that he wanted to do a side project with us. And so we were like, hell yeah, let's write some hits for Ivan. And then Ivan ended up backing away from it. But the songs were really good instrumentally without any vocals on them. And so one of those songs ended up somehow on a, a record that's a that's like a compilation or a collaboration record with D. Snyder, Jamie Josta, and a bunch of different singers. And this song in particular, Howard Jones, was one of the singers on it. So, and that song is called <laughs> I don't know, I can't remember the title, uh, but it's on there. Um, I, I can look it up. It's on my all music. You'll see it. Uh, it's a D. It was a D. Snyder, or whatever. Um, it's on allmusic.com and that's that's in my it's in my catalog as well so yeah things like that i noticed and looking back it's kind of you know nostalgic and kind of just yeah nostalgic and cool to to look back on on those and i realized how that you, how do you look back on your music like you you obviously evolved a lot as an artist you learned a lot of new things probably over the years like if you look back at the music you created then how how does your mind look at it now i mean uh, i look at it with love and <laughs> and uh, appreciation and like yeah that was you know maybe it's dated now or maybe it's wouldn't work now like it did then but it was good then and it's still good to me now the one thing that where i get self critical or sort of perfectionist like is when i hear mi earlier mixes that i did that i i can do way better now 
I just, because I'm always getting better as a mixer and engineer. Some of my older mixes, to me, they make me cringe a little bit, even though I don't say it out loud what I just did. But, but uh, yeah, but because I, because I, just because like I know I can do it better. I've, I'm always learning when it comes to engineering. And I think I'm always learning with songwriting as well, especially now with this new, the John Widowmaker thing, because it's not even heavy metal. It's, it's like outlaw country rap rock, which, it's kind of weird and all over the place when I say it, but it's hard to describe, really easy to like. It's like in all these lanes at the same time. And it's like a road hog. It's swerving across all these lanes on the road and it works somehow. Oh. Yeah. Curious to hear what comes out from that. Uh, honestly, <laughs> um, I I'm just a little bit mindful of the time. Uh, we have a lot of questions still, so we won't be able to handle them all. So I'll, I'll just throw in first one for my points as a, an employee, because uh, also Marcy, our CEO, he left a little question. And his question was, would you recommend a note music to other artists that you know? I, I will, actually. I would, and I actually will. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go pushing it around, but if someone sees this and they're like, what is that all about? I have all nothing but good things to say about a note and all of you at, at a note to work with. It's been amazing. And totally legit so, it's been yeah. so, so far it's been a, a real pleasure and we really look forward to seeing the results the end results and in six more days no nine more days of the auction so very curious to see where that everything goes um so going into the questions that we had from the audience um one is of uh ruan um that is asking um what is your opinion about the future of rock and metal? Um, will its audience grow and shrink over the next few decades? I mean, we've seen that in 2019, metal was the fastest growing music char, which so many years after its creation is, is quite stunning. Uh, what, what do you think that where it will go? I think overall, it's a, it's like a, a stable, it's like a, it's like a, a stable stock or a stable crypto if there's a, such a thing but <laughs> like it it's a long term it may dip and and grow but over over time it's gonna gain and you can see right now just by looking at like this arena tour with machine head and a monomar they're crushing it in all over europe but they're gonna do it over here too it's like in and a lot of other bands that are able to get out and tour in this difficult time for touring because it's so so challenging right now with costs being so up and restrictions and just like supplies and availability it's really challenging but still the fans are hungry for it and the fans are never going to go away like i said they stay with you they stay with you forever and i do machine head 25th anniversary there's people who was like i saw you in 95 this is my son he's 14 he loves machine head too a whole new army of younger fans like appreciating the classics as well as getting into all the newer stuff and yeah it's a, it's a genre that's not dying and it's not gonna go away you know yeah. yeah definitely yeah um another question that we got was um you especially with the band well with your 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 group stereo black uh you did a lot you had a lot of successes like in the productions uh, well it's a studio that was a studio thing really yeah well with, with that you had a lot well, of we did license a lot as those songs got into a lot of movie trailers and stuff like you yeah. know, so that, I would call that my my studio gangster era where I was like, we didn't really have a band to play live. It wasn't like a real band, but we were writing amazing music and producing it and had connections in in a sync license world in, in L.A. and getting them placed in really nice spots on on big movie trailers and in movies and in games and stuff. And yeah, that that's exactly where I wanted to go. Um, you, you got a lot of sync successes. And, and the question that we got was. Uh, do you think that licensing, uh, sync licensing represents an important field to be managed by emerging artists in order to boost their career and their visibility? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the right, I mean, when you hit the, if you hit the lottery and you get like a prominent placement on a movie that's a really successful movie and a song that resonates with the scene and people connect this beautiful moment in a movie with that song and the song becomes a hit, that's that can start an entire career from the one, one placement like that. That's an ex extreme example, but all of it helps because it usually pays well. It can help you sustain your your business. 
and expand your resume. And it's, you know, it gives you clout. It helps you get to the next one. You know, it's a win. Any sync license is a big win for um, independent emerging songwriter producers. Definitely, definitely. Um, another question that we got from Paul uh, Townrow was, uh, how do you feel about stems being released to the public for mixing? Is it something you would cons consider in the future or is it something you already did? Um, actually, I was featured on Nail the Mix, which is uh, a community. Well, it's it's part of URM. Uh, this is URM is a recording. What does it stand for? Joey Sturgis, famous producer Joey Sturgis, is also a software designer, and he owns also co-owns a thing called URM Music Academy. Um, and they do a thing called Nail the Mix, where they feature a mixer who mixed a song. It's, it's usually metal. So I did one for Gojira where you go in and you live stream kind of like this and you mix the song again in front of a community of people who will watch you and they share the screen and they say, if you talk about, oh, this is the parallel compression, this is the this, this is the mastering, this is that, that, what I did to the snare here, just like tutorial on the mix that you did, but also what they do when they announce that they go a month before they release this, the multi-track raw. I give them the, the, the file, multi-track files. I don't call them stems. that's, the term stems actually originally means mixed, like all drums, all bass is a stem, all the vocals mixed is a stem, all the guitars is a stem. So like if you have a mix, you could stem it down into five or six or eight categories of stereo stems and you play them all at unity and that's the mix, even though you, then you could do individual to those stems. But the real, when people say stems these days, they're talking about multi-track, like kick, snare, every, every track individually separated like 80 or 100 or whatever you know 60 whatever tracks you have so i gave the multi-tracks to the community and they downloaded them and they did their, their own mix and there was a contest and whoever did the best mix won like a thousand like won a cool prize you know oh. so i think that's really cool it's an interactive thing and it helps people in learning how to mix definitely and and as for you as an artist or the person that brings out that, those multi-tracks do you see like, oh, that's an interesting thing that that person did with that specific thing? I didn't listen to any of them. Okay. Fair, fair I, didn't, I didn't hear. No, I didn't. I, I, I would have had to go like search through and listen. I, I wasn't part of the judging of picking. If I would have had to judge and say, I like this is the one, but they, they, they did that internally. They have guys who would listen to all the mixes and compare them and AB them and pick the best one. And I didn't. You know, I didn't have them. Or I didn't ask because I didn't. I didn't have time. But but uh, but I would. I would be interested to see and maybe impressed or whatever. You know, like I'll see how they did something different or or whatever. You know, how that would be interesting to see. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, I I think we are getting towards the end, so uh, I won't be taking too much of your time anymore. Um, yeah. Well. Everyone, thank you very much. Uh, I see Andy, you got a question, uh, but that was answered on the chat by Irene, who's uh, our digital marketeer. So thank you, Irene, for being team player also here. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. We're really happy to work together with you on this. Uh, whenever you get around in Europe for a tour, if, if that happens, we'll definitely make sure that we'll meet up. Or if we get around in, in LA or Las, Las Vegas or wherever you are. Um, that's something we'll definitely do. Um, so everybody that is here that hasn't invested in the catalog yet and is interested, it's still possible to invest. However, you will have to raise your minimum bet. It's no, uh, as the auction is fully completed, you can still outbid other investors. Um, we're following the Dutch auction process, which is very simple, explained, at the end of the auction, we collect all the bids that we received and we go for the lowest of all the high bids that actually completes the auction sale and that becomes a new price per sale, uh, per share, sorry. Um, so if you want to grab one of Logan's or multiple of Logan's shares to his catalog, uh, go to anomusic.com, place your bid. There you still have nine days. And uh, afterwards you will start receiving on a quarterly basis a uh, royalty payout for the music of uh, that Logan is produced, well, has produced in the past, and that is currently 
being listened to on Spotify, YouTube, being played in bars, radios, wherever you, you can think of. Um, Logan, thank you very much for your time. Uh, have a lovely day in, in Las Vegas in your studio. And uh, maybe you, I'll give the last word to you uh, if you want to say something still to the people here. Yeah, well, thank you, Nils, and everyone at A-Note for this. Was a, has been really great working with you. And this was a fun webinar. And everyone in the room, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate you. Everyone who helped invest, thank you so much. I, just, I very much appreciate you. So that's about it. <laughs>